Welcome to the Ayan Hirsi Ali podcast, a home for critical thinking and common sense. Like all of you, my thoughts have been constantly on the situation in Afghanistan and the devastating effects that the people of Afghanistan now face, and on an international level, how this affects the United States' position as a world leader. My guest today is William Migoran. Mr. Migoran writes the weekly Main Street column on Tuesday for the Wall Street Journal. He's a member of that paper's editorial board. From 05 to 08, he served as chief speechwriter for President George W. Bush in the West Wing of the White House. He began his career as a newspaper man. He was the chief editorial writer for the Wall Street Journal and spent more than a decade overseas in Europe and in Asia for the journal's overseas editions as well as for the Far Eastern Economic Review. He has written for a wide variety of publications from the Washington Post and the New York Post to The Spectator in London and Fast Things. Bill is author of The Perfidious Albion, The Abandonment of Hong Kong 1997, as well as a monograph on terrorism. He holds a bachelor's degree in philosophy from the University of Notre Dame and has a master's in communications from Boston University. He has served on a number of voluntary organizations, including the Presidential Commission on White House Fellows. Bill, welcome to my podcast. Bill, thank you very much for joining me. We are recording on Tuesday, August 31. It's midnight in Kabul. The U.S. military has been withdrawn from what the Biden administration describes as America's longest war. Uh, You and I both just witnessed uh, the press statement from the president. And as he was giving his statement, I recall your column of yesterday in the Wall Street Journal. And there you say, for Mr. Biden, the top priority was to use the 20th anniversary of 9-11 to take a victory lap as the president who ended America's longest war. When Kabul fell, it added a new imperative avoid any U.S. combat casualties that would mar the moment, even at the cost of leaving Americans behind enemy lines and abandoning uh, Afghan partners. You continue, critics who accuse the president of having no strategy miss the point. What we are seeing is the strategy. It's based on Mr. Biden's confidence that no one will hold the disastrous consequences of his decisions about Afghanistan against him so long as our troops are gone. My first question to you is, really? Yes, uh, I think that's what, he's, that's what he believes. If you look at the, uh, the address that he just gave to explain um, his decisions and what we've just seen these last two weeks from Kabul, he doubled down insisted he made no mistakes, that it could not have gone better. He's done everything right. Everyone else is wrong. Um, He mentioned our capabilities uh, to fight new threats of terror. As you know, you well know, um, the threat of terror has metastasized. It is in many more places than it was, say, 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. But here's the question. Does anyone believe that this bungled exit from Afghanistan, where we betrayed our allies and and basically surrendered lots of things to our enemies does anyone believe this enhances our capabilities and then the last part uh what struck me about the whole operation is um joe biden was afraid politically of military casualties and so he did everything to avoid those. By, by that, I mean, instead of saying our mission is to get people out, we're going to use our highly trained people to do that the way they know how. He put all these restrictions on them because he didn't want the casualties. He got them anyway, because yeah. that's what happens when you go on defense. But he also mentioned uh, toward the end about how going forward, like the lesson is that we can hit people with uh, without boots on the ground. He meant the unmanned drones and missiles. And I think right. those are tremendous capabilities. But if that's what the next three and a half years are going to be, just in, uh, we send up a drone when someone does something, um, we're in a lot of trouble. Oh, absolutely. Um, and again, I think that brings us, as we take in 
the ineptitude and sort of the absent-mindedness, the casual way in which he's putting this forward, there's also been a lot of leaking going on from the other agencies. Now, when I reflect on, uh, you know, the Trump administration, he blamed the Trump administration for um, putting him in this position. Uh, he's uh, advancing the narrative and has been doing so for a while that he had no choice. Um, and then there are people within his administration who disagree. None of those people resigned. They're leaking, but they're not resigning. Jim Mattis resigned over this. Um, I know that uh, there were very disagreement, very strong disagreements between Trump and H.R. McMaster and the rest of his uh, defense team. We know of the dramatic resignation of John Bolton and uh, him bringing out his book. We're not seeing any of that. They're sticking together through thick and thin. Yes. I mean, in some senses, I have some sympathy for them because it's clear that the real decision on this was made by Joe Biden. You know, a lot of people wonder about whether with old age he's becoming more infirm and incapable of making decisions. But if you look at what he did, it's very consistent with what he advocated for many years, even as vice president. Remember, as vice president, he voted against going after bin Laden um, in that. So in some senses, I, I have some sympathy for them because they're carrying out um, their boss's disastrous policy. The question is, and this this is something hearings could get to, I, I think um, President Biden told a lot of fibs about this, about how everyone agreed with him and so forth. And I'd like to see uh, people in responsible positions answer under oath about a lot of those statements. For example, did everyone agree that we should surrender Bagram Air Force Base? Um, or did they agree after he imposed all these conditions? Um, there are a lot, of, uh, a lot of questions here. So I would have liked to seen someone resign but again, the person who's most responsible for this is Joe Biden himself. Um, you're right, and I look forward to the hearings. Um, and in, in terms of um, the institutions in the U.S. that hold um, presidents and administrations accountable, the other one is the one in which you are a part of, which is the press. And I know you and your paper, the Wall Street Journal paper, you do an, a fantastic job of that. But the general media... Um, have been negligent, and I know it's a little bit better now, uh, but in the process towards um, his election and even towards selecting members of his administration, I feel like there wasn't enough critical scrutiny of who these people are and what um, their resumes represent for America and, uh, and America's interests. Well, I think people trusted Joe Biden. Remember, he presented himself as he was the guy who was going to return us to normal. People called him the adult in the room. Um, he had all these years. He was the most versed in diplomacy from all his years as a senator. Um, you know, and, and basically it was just accepted. You know, he sat in his basement in Delaware and it was just accepted and people went after Donald Trump. Now, I, sh I should be clear. I, I agreed with Donald Trump on a lot of things, but I did not agree with him on Afghanistan. I think that his deal to leave was not a good deal, was a bad idea. That said, I also don't believe he would have carried it out in such a disastrous way. I think he would have paid more heed. We'll never know. In some senses, Donald Trump is irrelevant to this because Joe Biden made all these decisions. And uh, basically everyone, as you say, they gave him a pass. They accepted Joe Biden's own definition of himself as this wise, experienced leader when I think the truth was closer to what Bob Gates said. Um, you know, once that he, that on every major decision um, since since the seventies, every major foreign policy decision, Joe Biden's been on the wrong side, and I think that's pretty accurate. That is pretty accurate. That's absolutely accurate. Let's talk a little bit about what the consequences are. So he stood now right in front of the whole world and said, "We have actually achieved our goals. No more terrorism. We have to look into the future, not the past." Um, I, I mean, it, it's, it's very, 
morbid to think of, okay, how long is it before we have a major terrorist attack on our soil? And given, this is all also um, playing out with, you know, in the background is uh, this whole debacle of um, our own borders. Right. Uh, no, I agree with you. Look, I and you know better than anyone else. I mean, two things. One thing that drives me crazy is uh, people saying this is 20 years of failure and right. um, we failed because of nation building. We failed because we didn't fail because some of those things were mistakes. Yeah. But we didn't fail because of that. We failed because Joe Biden chose failure. He yeah. chose to end it. And the way he chose to end it so he could give this speech on 9-11 kind of making the points he made today yeah. um, and present himself as the the American president who got us out of our longest war. That's what ended it, his decision. Was Afghanistan perfect? No. And you probably, again, yes. you're more aware than most people. Right. Some of the ideas Americans have about democracy and about how making all these people in the rest of the world over in our image, yes, they were exaggerated. Um, they were wrong. But I still believe that Afghanistan, before the Taliban retook control, was better today because we were there than it was 20 years ago. I believe it enhanced our capabilities to fight terror and make sure it didn't become a safe haven. I mean, the standard is ridiculous that yeah. because of all these things that led to failure. None of those things led to failure. And sometimes success isn't doesn't mean that Afghanistan has suddenly become France overnight. Yeah. What it means is we've avoided the worst, as in North Korea, where we've right. been for 70, and we prevented the North Koreans from taking over the South. Sometimes the best you can do is avoiding the worst. And I think we're just in very bad shape. And it's not, you mentioned the possibility of terrorist attacks on the United States. I think the, the possibility just went up quite a bit. It'll take the terrorists a while to reconstitute themselves and build their alliances in the new Afghanistan, but they will. But there's a lot more vulnerable targets. I mean, there, there are a lot of Americans overseas. I lived yeah. overseas for 12 years. You're very vulnerable over there. Right. So it's not just that. And, and to me, and again, I, I would defer to you, mm -hmm. to me, the silliest thing about this is even the idea that we ended our longest war. You know, when the 9-11 Commission put out its report about all the mistakes that led to 9-11, one of the things that it said was that Al-Qaeda was at war with the U.S. long before we were at war with Al-Qaeda. That's right. Uh, you know, we had a lot of attacks on the USS Cole and so forth on our yeah. embassies in Africa. And just because we've left the battlefield in Afghanistan yeah. does not mean that they've stopped trying to war on us. In fact, it fits their ideology for years. When I was in the Bush White House and we wrote speeches, we read a lot of what al-Qaeda would say. And often they said, Vietnam proves that America does not have the stomach for the long fight that sooner or later, if we wait them out, they will cut and run. Yeah. Well, they all ha they must believe they were right. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. If there's one thing I know, it is, and I'm steeped in it, it is um, their ideology. And that is exactly their, their way of thinking. And not only um, do they believe that America does not have the stomach for long projects, and long wars and American short termism is something I think they understand better than most Americans. But they also believe that America is morally decadent. And because of that moral decay, that they, the ideology of political Islam, is the only legitimate replacement for that. And in that sense, they are playing a very, very long game, and we're making it easy on so many, so many different fronts. Bill, one thing that... Uh, Biden keeps repeating, uh, and he mean, and a lot of people who who are giving us these false choices of it was either to stay there forever, or it was to get out and get out the way we just did, is this um, citing of the corruption, the three hundred million dollars a day for two decades. I don't want to do that for another decade. We need that money. We need those resources, for other threats, um, the corruption. There was a lot of corruption. 
why could we not um, uh, why could we not fight the corruption the way we would fight corruption in America or any other place through simple means of auditing the Pentagon if it's the Pentagon and ex Pentagon guys who were contracting and the, all this money is missing. I, I, I mean, am I too naive, too simplistic to say, why don't we just have an auditing system in place and hold people who are responsible for the corruption and stop well, it? Well, certainly we should. And um, I would say two things. One is the president mentioned that price tag of all those millions and so forth. That would, would you be willing to pay that price tag if it resulted that there were no terrorist attacks on the United States. That's what we have to weigh it against. Um, now, maybe we could have done the same thing in a cheaper way. Corruption, I think, is endemic uh, to government because you're spending money that's not yours, so people aren't as cautious with it. They swing it around. Whenever you have large amounts, you're going to have large corruption. I think you're going to especially have it in... Um, in developing countries, you know, uh, I think Afghanistan was a backward country and so forth. You know, when I lived in Asia, a lot of the places like South Korea was was known for incredible corruption because the government was very involved um, in the economy. And I think over time, countries, the, the best way to, to go after corruption is to reduce the government's role in the economy. And in Afghanistan, I'm not sure how realistic that that would have been. So, um, you know, I, I, th I think corruption of all the prices that we paid in Afghanistan, corruption was the smallest. There are a lot of countries that we're allied with that we could say are corrupt. There are a lot of countries that we give money to and they spend it on something else. Uh, it's not good, but um, it's, it's not the worst uh, that can happen. The question is, what are you getting for that money? Sometimes, sometimes you... Um, you pay money for some of these corrupt governments and you keep them propped up and it's actually hurting you. But in this case, if, if I had to choose between the Taliban, even if the Taliban is not corrupt and a corrupt Afghan government, I think I would choose the corrupt Afghan government because it's safer for me and my children and you. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely true. And you and I happen to agree on Afghanistan and on, um, the fact that uh, with America, it was better for America's vital interests if we remain in Afghanistan longer. But there are people who are also putting forward um, what I would say serious uh, opposition to that position. And let's say 60% uh, 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 of Americans wanted to get out. Okay, I know that the polling um, was defective. Um, if you had told Americans this would be the consequence or there would be a terrorist attack, then those numbers might have been different. But in any case, even if you were to agree with the position that we needed to get out, why this way? Right. No, that, that, that is the question. Look, I think the, the answer is that the, the true answer to why we should stay with all these problems, all what looked like a lack of success, all the setbacks, that's a hard question to answer, and you can't do it in a sound bite, right? Yeah. And uh, again, my, my argument is that sometimes the best solution is an imperfect, messy one that at least has enough peace, like you stop the bombs dropping, enough peace for people to develop and advance, which I think we saw in South Korea. You know, yes. in 1950, South Korea was a pretty nasty place, right. and it was run by a military junta, you know, for the next um, almost 30 years, mm -hmm. you know, that we backed. They had assassinations. They had coups, all sorts of things. And we backed it. And eventually they developed, they claimed their own democracy and went on. Now, I'm not saying Afghanistan would have gone exactly the same path, mm -hmm. but I would contend that Afghanistan was a better place. It's certainly a better place for girls, isn't it? Was Absolutely. a better place for oh, girls right. than yeah. it is now, yeah. just in some concrete measure. And for a lot of people, I don't recall when the Afghan government was in control. Do you recall if anyone was hanging on to a U.S. plane, falling off a plane from the sky because they thought it was so bad and they were so upset with corruption? So I think we have to be realistic um, about that. It, it also speaks well of Americans that they don't want to be a, a, 
in other countries in the sense that we don't want to be an occupier. Yeah. We just want to be left alone, safe to pursue our interests, and we wish well of everyone else. Um, sometimes we have to go to these places to protect themselves. But it speaks well that America's instinct is not to conquer. We're not a conquering power. Yeah. Um, sometimes we have to behave like one, uh, take control, but we're not a conqueror. So it's a good instinct of the American people. But also a lot of the people that you, you kind of cite making that argument, mm -hmm. I think they think the American people are children, that they can't yeah. understand yeah. They can't understand a real argument, a hard argument. Yeah. And remember, a lot of these people, they're the ones sending their sons and daughters into harm's way. I think they can understand the argument. They may not agree with me on the conclusions, but I think you can appeal to them and say, I know this is a sacrifice. Mm -hmm. This is very hard. And you live in Ohio, and you're sending your boy all the way to Afghanistan, and you must wonder what that means. But let me tell you, it's for the United States in the long run, and you can be proud of what we're doing. I'm sure there were a lot of young boys coming from families yeah. you know, that died in Normandy and never knew the names of those towns before they hit those beaches. Absolutely true, absolutely true. And you know, in that regard, I see two... I don't know what you call them, working theories or doctrines or whatever. On the one side, uh, Biden, the Democratic Party, uh, liberals, and this whole idea of, you know, America is really no different from any other place. Yes, we want to be left alone, and the way for that to happen is for us to leave everyone else alone. Um, and then the other, uh, the, Obama's leading from behind, uh, all sorts of different phrases for that. And then the other one is uh, what I would say Republicans, maybe to a, a larger extent conservatives, that uh, we lead through, uh, and it's, uh, the slogan now is peace through strength. And so with these two, would you, first of all, would you describe those as doctrines? Uh, yes, yeah, certainly peace through strength. Yes, I, I, I do believe that. Yeah. And... And I think this has then implications for our our place, the place of the United States in the world, that if we have um, a democratic administration, we're going to withdraw and tear up, um, you know, agreements and, and policies and strategies that a Republican administration had developed and the other way around. That doesn't make us in any way reliable. Right. No, I agree. Look, as I said, we're torn between two instincts. On the one hand, Americans, their attitude toward the world is we want to mind our own business, right? We don't want to tell other people how to live or so forth. But again, we go back, why were we in Afghanistan at all? Um, we were in Afghanistan because they knocked down two of our buildings in in uh, the middle of New York and they attacked our Pentagon, you know, and that was planned from Afghanistan because it was a safe haven. And we learned that even small groups, I mean, the scary thing about terrorism is it doesn't have to be an army. We used to be protected by oceans and we're not protected. So that's why we were there. Now, some people say we should have just got out um, afterward. But again, I go back to places, you know, we used to recognize we're still in Germany uh, how many decades after we defeated Hitler, how many decades after the Soviet Union um, came to an end, we're still in Japan. Um, we're still in Korea with a lot more forces than we had in um, uh, in Afghanistan. And we're there for our own reasons, you know, that it's better that way. In a lot of these places in Korea, there's not a solution yet. It, you know, it, talk about longest wars. I believe the Korean War is still going on. There was only an armistice, so technically they're still at war, and uh, we're allied with the South Koreans. So that's really our strongest war. Does anyone want to upset things and change the equation up there to pull out? Um, what would that do today? Uh, yes, it would spare us from, from deploying all those troops there, but um, we deploy the troops there because it makes the entire region safer and it's made Asia, for example, a big trade hub. We, it's made Europe far more secure than it was before World War II. Uh, and I believe that a long-term U.S. presence, not out fighting in combat, right. but as they were in Afghanistan, supporting the government and in Iraq, combat operations largely local, 
I think that would have a good effect on the Middle East and make it a more hopeful place, both for the people there and for us. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, I think that a lot of people uh, misunderstand when we say, you know, America should not be the world's policeman, we should mind our own business. Uh, Or vital interests are described and defined in very narrow ways and in very cynical ways um, that we forget that actually America is very different and exceptional and uh, don't use that denigrating phrase of policeman, <laughs> but it right. is the world order we built after 1945. And if we if we're going to decline and we stop leading, we'll create a void, and that's going to be filled uh, by very unpleasant adversaries: China, Russia, Pakistan, Iran. Uh, in this void that we just created now, I think it is worth for Americans to look into uh, what would any other country do? What would China do, for instance, if um, they were faced with a terrorist attack launched from Afghanistan onto their soil or in any way that um, uh, you know threatens their vital interests? They will treat the people of Afghanistan like the Uyghur uh, Chinese people, like those 10 million people. There is going to be no um, respect um, or honor of human life or human rights. And I think most people overlook that. I think I, I think you're absolutely right on China. I mean, the idea that China, which doesn't treat its own people well, is going to treat other people well is uh, just ridiculous. Uh, I think what you're saying is th- the real lesson, it seems to me, of America's different failures. You know, if you go back to the first Iraq war, if you remember, we didn't go to Baghdad. President Bush Sr., the father, um, decided not to go to Baghdad. And and Saddam Hussein's Republican Guard went there, reconstituted itself. And then we had to go back later, right? right? Um, and, And so forth. And you look at what we're doing, how this exit happened, because we didn't have enough troops in there, because... President Biden was afraid of deploying troops. He didn't want to look like a man putting troops on the ground and risk any casualties that might come from an engagement. I think the lesson is pretty clear in the world. In a in a very dangerous world, yeah. if you're a big power, either you control the situation, mm-hmm. right, yeah. your way as much as you can, yeah. or it's going to control you. And I think what we saw in the last uh, two weeks yeah of this this horrible um, tragedy in Afghanistan is the situation controlling us. Yeah. So much so that in the end, we were begging the Taliban <laughs> to protect us. Yeah. I mean, we ha- we're asking the Taliban to protect our troops, yeah. um, even as they're not letting some of our civilians get to the airport. It just seems insanity to me. So I think your, 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 your an- the answer is, or the principle is, if you don't control a situation, it's going to control you, the other side. It's not going to be a void. Someone is going to walk into that void. And just because America doesn't do it doesn't mean that China, Russia, someone else um, won't either. Someone else is going to fill that void. And I would, in general, rather the United States fills that void yeah. than other people. Absolutely. And that the United States rallies uh, you know, like-minded liberal democracies like ours. Now, there are some people who are saying, well, something good will come out of this. Okay, the withdrawal was botched, but it kind of sends a message to, for instance, our NATO allies who were not willing to or had to be pushed into paying their dues. They can't even look after their own borders. And so for them to see America's not going to solve their problems, this will drive them into rethinking their own strategy. Is there any merit to that argument? Um, well, you know, I think I think that's partly true, but not in the good sense. <laughs> uh, NATO, I believe, is the um, it, we got the other countries to come in to help us. We were the ones that are, were attacked. The United, we, the United States, yeah. we were attacked, and we used the alliance. We invoked something called Article Five, um, where um, I think it was Article Five yeah. of uh, of NATO, where or Article Two. I can't I, now. I'm trying to remember. Um, 
I think it's Article 5, Collective Defense, which is that if anyone in NATO was attacked, it was like an attack on everyone. This is the first time that that was invoked. So the, the, all our allies actually came to our side in NATO and fought with us. And this was a giant defeat for NATO. And they weren't consulted at the end. You know, Joe Biden wasn't taking calls or anything. So, um, you know, they're definitely going to be reconsidering uh, relying on America. But I'm not sure that means it's always good. I think a lot of times they're going to say, I'm not going to go along with America yeah. because they're not going to be there in the pinch um, for us. And that, that points out to one of the things that's forgotten. You know, you, you always hear some kinds of policy, especially the very cold-blooded dis- do um described as realist yes, you know yes. let's let, let's just be cold blooded have no morals at all yeah. and so forth and just do what's coldly interested i think that's a short term thing because i don't think it is actually always in your interest mm-hmm. to be as cold bloodedly realistic you need people to trust you cuz sometimes you ask them to do dif- difficult things right. like we've always we frequently ask the israelis don't attack you know in response to this yeah. we'll take care of something if they trust you, they'll do it. Right mm-hmm. now, um, a lot of the countries in Asia, for example, trust us yeah. because we have Japan yeah. in the alliance. They're afraid of Japan. Most of the nations in Asia are more afraid of Japan than China. Americans think that's crazy, yeah. but a lot of them have hard memories right of World War II and they fear the Japanese. But they don't worry about the Japanese so long as the Japanese are close to America. But if Japan starts feeling that America is not looking out for its own interests and so forth, um, Japan might start to go its separate ways and we might not find that quite as convenient. Uh, Europe seems to be, you know, uh, with the European Union and so forth, you know, what if they decide that instead of NATO, they're going to have a European Union with military force that might not always agree with U.S. interests. So I, I think, look, whenever you're unreliable, you pay a price for it. And I, I just can't believe we're not going to pay a high price for um, the, the, the absolute horrible way that we, um, we executed this retreat. Absolutely. And also all the talk on emboldening China now in its ambitions um, to what are we going to say, annex Taiwan? I mean, they've, yeah. Right. So it, it's not just that we um, we send the message that we're unreliable to our allies, but also we it, the same message goes to the adversaries to say, uh, you can go ahead and do whatever you want. And, you know, who knows? We may or may not rise to the occasion. Right. Uh, I mean, that's why, we're, you know, we're sending signals both to our friends yeah. Into our enemies. I mean, our enemies now. If you were, if you were Vladimir Putin or Xi Jinping, and you were listening to Joe Biden say he made no mistakes in this, and basically say, you know, in the future, we're not going to use our troops. We're going to use unmanned, over the horizon capacities. Um, that's going to affect your calculations, and probably not in a good way for America. So again, I I think it's very very dangerous. I mean, the world is not a sentimental place. There there are lots of bad people who are not constrained, and the only thing that will stop them is, um, it, you know, if I'm a bad person and you know it, sometimes the only thing that's going to stop me from attacking you yeah. is the knowledge that you're going to defeat yeah. me. Right. Um, And that's the only thing that will stop them, not because they say, oh, this is the wrong thing to do or I should be more cooperative with the international community. And I I think there's no substitute for being strong. You know, people say peace through strength. Um, It really is strength first, peace second. Peace comes after you have no one's going to you cannot negotiate. I mean, one of the mistakes I think the Americans made in Iraq the second time was for a good long part of the war. We were trying to get the Iraqi, the different parties, the different um, Muslim sects, yeah. you know, the Shias and the Sunnis, to come together and make an agreement. We were trying to do at the diplomatic table what we had failed to do on the battlefield. Yeah. And it never happened. And it only happened after the surge when President Bush said, We're, I'm doubling down, mm-hmm. we're going to win. And he did. 
and then then it cleared the way to do more political things but you can't substitute that's the great danger it's always easy to think you can substitute diplomacy for strength and you can't do it diplomacy without strength is um is a fig leaf you know you'll you'll see um sooner or later it will be exposed for the weak agreement it is it's it's a joke diplomacy without power is a joke and i think uh, the world is realistic enough to know that and to make those calculations um we talked about a lot and i have i could talk to you for another hours and hours and hours um but i really wanted to revisit your take on cynicism because um what just happened has consequences for afghanistan and the people of afghanistan and the women of afghanistan it has consequences for our allies uh, on the geopolitical level but it also has consequences for america on the domestic level and i want to read another quote that uh, you put not in yesterday's column but last week's um and you say maybe it was in yesterday's you say in demanding moments great presidents appeal to the better angels of our nature but mr biden's presidency now rests on a cynical bet that by september 11 uh, by the time september 11 rolls around a war weary american people will share the president's indifference to what he has now wrought in afghanistan we can already imagine his response to any newsman who dares bring it up come on man that was 2 weeks ago this is in yesterday's column <laughs> it's of course no laughing matter but um the i think what gave him and his administration the confidence to go ahead with this arbitrary days of august 31 were his polls the ratings now those ratings have slipped and uh, our system in america is one where it, it, you are held accountable by the people what do you think this will do to his presidency not what he thinks but just from you know your impartial perspective right well i'm not sure i'm impartial <laughs> but um well the the first thing you know the line the better natures of our uh, angels of our nature that's from abraham lincoln from his first inaugural address you know he took office at a time of crisis when i i believe you know there were 11 states in the confederacy and i think seven i don't know between 5 and 7 had already seceded before he even took the oath um so it was a time of crisis and i think he was asking the american people to do a hard thing to fight for the union and so forth which would mean a fight with brother against brother um but he that's what he meant by the better angels of our nature like we we can fix this and it i'm appealing to the best of you it strikes me that joe biden his presidency now he's he's appealing almost to the worst of the american people right. to think okay we understand i mean i think everyone understands why people would be tired of afghanistan yeah. it's been 20 years it it seems that we make no progress i mean i think we actually have made progress yeah. you know if you compare it to the beginning yeah. and i think we have do have some good results to show for it including no tax on our home soil yeah. um but i can understand people being weary of that and i think that um Joe Biden just doesn't care. You know, he wanted this great speech where to present himself as this great pre- important president who ended our war. Yeah. If you remember that about a week ago he gave an interview to George Stephanopoulos about Afghanistan. This was somewhat in the beginning and it was at a time when people were thinking, you know, one of the problems is uh, he doesn't seem very human. Yeah, yeah. You know, very he's kind of robotic in this, yeah. not caring. And it was shocking. I think to people when George Stephanopoulos asked him about those young Afghan men desperately trying to hold on to the plane as it t- took off and then you see them falling off at 2000 feet what did Joe Biden say did he say oh it's tragic you know any time there's a war there's going to be tragic my heart goes out to their families no he said that was 4 days ago 5 days ago kind of yeah. you know why are you bugging yeah. me yeah. and so that that was the reference i made in the line yeah. there um and i think right now he's betting mm-hmm. that it all these disasters won't be held against him because the american people will just be so happy that our troops are home i'm i don't have i don't share 
such a low and cynical view of the American people. The American people, yes, would prefer our boys come home. But the American people understand sacrifice. They do not like to be humiliated in public. They do not like to sell out people who have counted on us, leave American citizens behind. And I don't think they're going to be happy when we start seeing, as I think we will see, assuming any images can get out, of the various barbarities that the Taliban in their, you know, in the midst of their victory are going to inflict on innocent Afghan people. And I don't think the American people will like that. And I, I hope that they'll they'll push back. But I think that Joe Biden's bad is this cynical one. People won't care. No one will care about Afghanistan if their son or daughter isn't stationed there. And I'm I'm not so sure that's a good bet. Uh, I, I, I really agree with you. I don't think Americans like toddlers being tossed over razor fences right. or people being trampled. And uh, we're going to see those images again of women being whipped, being stoned. Right. Um, it just even the symbol, it, and it has come back. Uh, you've seen the burqa is back. I'm not talking about the... The nice right. uh, little Dubai, yeah, Dubai right. thing. I'm talking about the big blue one. Uh, right. and, and that's all back. Um, and I don't think that Americans like the look of that. And you can tell by just the sheer number of people from the wealthiest who are lending their airplanes and writing big checks uh, to see who they can rescue, to veterans grouping together and taking people out. To just, I mean, like my even here, in, you would say we are in Silicon Valley, so a, lo- a lot of um, uh, my uh, my community, uh, avid supporters of of Biden, his administration, they can do no wrong, but even they are scratching their heads about why did it have to be this way. But so the the idea um, that. A, Americans are stupid. You remember Hillary Clinton's uh, basket of de- deplorables? And I think this is just, uh, it's a Washington thing. It's uh, the people who poll, the people who want uh, American votes, they convince themselves that the population is stupid and that you can spoon feed them anything, you can lie to them. You don't have to get your story straight because nobody's going to ask questions. And I think that's a big mistake on their part. And I really, really hope um, that there's some accountability for that next year uh, during the congressional elections and in 2024. And that will be the best uh, chance. Look, I I don't believe, I mean, I share a belief. I don't believe that America's job is to go into every bad country where there are really terrible governments doing terrible things and fix it. I I don't believe that's our job. But I do believe that when we go into a country, as we did in Afghanistan, and turn the whole place upside down, that it is better to leave it a better place than we found it, a little more stable, um, more opportunities for people, certainly more opportunities for girls. And I think we see that that the U.S. was essential in that regard. And I think we changed a lot of lives and opened a lot of doors. I mean, I'm a I'm a father of three girls. And so many times when I watch this, you know, I think, what would what would I do if I were stuck there with my what what would I be thinking if I have a rifle and I'm trying to defend some position, but I'm thinking of my three girls at home with my wife. I mean, it's, it's, it's unimaginable yeah. to Americans, that kind of horror and, and terror. And we know, you know, we know what they did before right. and now they've won, they've defeated their biggest enemy and they've won. So why would they be any less brutal now? They might not want to provoke a, an attack, but also I, I think, you know, we're only getting a few images from Kabul. I don't know what internet connections there are now and who wants to have something on their phone that they've sent mm-hmm. out, you know, to, to the Western world. We're not going to see most of the really awful things that they yeah. do. Um, it's going to be hidden because it's a very um, uh, rugged, rural uh, place in the world. It's just so, I, I think it's just so sad. And I think the normal human empathy that Americans can identify with these people. When you, when we saw 
uh, you know, the, to me, one of the other victims of the Biden policy was before we surrendered the airport in the early days, Afghans are um, piling around the fences. And, you know, you saw these girls holding out their yeah. hands saying, please save us from the t telling Marines. Yeah. Think if you're a 19 year old Marine, yeah. how your heart goes out to these people. But you can't do right. anything. You have to stand there. It's a horrible thing. And I don't think the American people are cold hearted. No. I, I, I don't think that they're just going to write it off and say, oh, tough luck. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, you know, we don't care anymore. I, I just, I don't, I don't, I have more faith, in, I have more faith in the American people than I do in the American leadership. Uh, yeah, and that's it. That is really a good note uh, to end on. I think we now, I mean, in order to reverse the leaders we have and, and to hold Washington, both sides of the aisle, accountable, I think we really have to depend on the American people. And the only way to do it is to inform and to share that information because, I don't know, the traditional media has gone off a cliff and then you have social media where you know no one can account for what is true and what's not. But the more we share these stories, I think the more the American people are informed about what's happening, who's responsible for what. I think we can keep our, our system going. Um, but I have to be honest with you, I don't feel highly optimistic about um, either one of the parties. This um, I, there's a storybook that I <laughs> we're told not to read Dr. Seuss anymore because he's supposedly racist. Right. So obviously that's what I do. I'm going to read Dr. Seuss. And there's one little story that I think is overlooked by most people, and it's one. It's called the North Going Zacks and the South Going Zacks. Right. <laughs> and there's this moment right. where none of them are going to budge, but the world is going to go around them. And I look at the sort of this the, the leadership of both parties, and I think that's what they remind me of. They don't make sense anymore, and the world will have to go around them. Um, and I hope that the American people lead the way and, and make that either budge or we come up with something else. I agree. I think we're looking for uh, we're looking for someone to stand forward and cut through kind of the nonsense on both sides and to come up with a coherent strategy for the world that will make us safer living within our means and within our yeah. commitments, but recognizing what's in our interest and also recognizing that though we're not perfect in general, almost all, the U.S. influence abroad has almost always been for yeah. good. It's almost always we've left people better off than we found them. And we should have confidence in that and not be afraid to project our force because we're not doing it for conquest. And the alternative, as you said so brilliantly, is if we don't do it, someone else is going to do for us. Right. And I, I know that the American people, most of them understand that. And it doesn't hurt to communicate it over and over again. Um, yeah, the, the, we, are, we now have these culture wars that are fought on an internal level, and I think to the rest of the world sometimes maybe uh, we radiate this um, image that we no longer know who we are, what our principles are, we don't agree on them. Uh, talking of human rights, you have uh, this, uh, this State Department uh, conveying to uh, the rest of the world, proselytizing about identity politics and um, critical theory and uh, gender fluidity. These things don't make sense to most Americans, and they don't make sense to most human beings on the planet. And I think we have to fight on these different levels of who are we, what do we represent, and how are we going to protect our moral interests, our national interests, our constitutional interests, and, and then how are we going to have a relationship with the rest of the world on that basis. And I totally buy right now, I don't think I'll change that, but the peace through strength, there's something to that. Well, I, I, I'd put it stronger. There's no peace without yes. strength. Right? Without strength. Without strength is someone else's strength, whether that's Mr. Putin's or Mr. Yeah, Xi's. Yeah. Um, those are the two big yeah. choices. So I agree with you. Well, thank you so much, Bill, for taking this time. Oh, thank, thank you. you. It's really a delight. Thank you 
for listening to the Ayan Hirsi Ali podcast. If you like what you've heard, please consider giving my podcast a rating on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you, and until next time.